You don't have to hear it through the grapevine. You can hear it and see it right here on the Gardening Simplified Show as we broadcast from Studio A at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs with Stacy Hervella, Adriana Robinson, and myself, Rick Weiss. Boy, I tell you what, it's go time. It's grow time. It's May. Yes, it is the height. Uh, it is literally the height of the gardening season. So we're going to hit you with some random thoughts as we get into uh, into growing. It's, you know, the season is a marathon. And I love the quote from Charles Schultz. He was the creator of the Peanuts cartoon, Snoopy and Charlie Brown. And he said, running is good. I'm a runner. And, uh, and so it caught my eye. Running is good for the ground. It makes it feel needed. I Aww. thought that was great. It is nice. So it's gardening <laughs> then in that case, because uh, definitely need the ground for gardening. Exactly. And here's the point, Stacy. B-Y-O-B, not bring your own beer, but uh, rather what you should do is build your own basin. Ooh. Build your own basin. So as you're putting these fledgling little plants into the ground and you prepare the soil, I always say take it the next, next step and... Provide a perimeter basin around uh, the plant to help hold the water and the nutrients initially and get it off to a good start. Well, that's especially important when you have super sandy soil like we do out here exactly. on the west side of the state uh, where you can't really build it up too well and it, it wants to run off. So it's sort of like akin to uh, leaving a watering lip when you yes. pot up a plant in a container. You've got that inch or so of area where water can accumulate and the plant can take it up. So this is a similar kind of thing, but just in the ground. And it's free. You don't have to buy anything to do it. Just use the soil to make a little basin. Now, soil is not a single entity. It's a mix of several things. I call the existing soil the parent soil. Uh, but when you work in organic material and mix them in with the existing parent soil, you probably get the best results. Whereas compost is organic matter that is decomposed or decomposing. And Stacy, when I was in Europe, it was interesting, or you watch some of these programs, uh, gardeners in Europe, what we call potting soil, they call compost. Yes. A bag of compost. You see that if you follow any kind of like British, you know, gardening accounts on Instagram, or you watch any British gardening shows, everything's compost to them. We yeah. have a, we have a much more literal definition of it here, but there it is, the potting compost. Yeah. You know, here, for example, we would call it a chocolate bar, not really what it is, sugar and fat with food colorings and some cocoa in it, right? Oh, geez, you're no fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love chocolate. <laughs> hey, by the way, as we start planting, it's grow time. Take me to your weeder. Stacy. it's important to keep up with weeds in the landscape because they, uh, they really compete with your, uh, with your plants for moisture and nutrients. Uh, I have to confess to our listeners right now that over the weekend, the thought did cross my mind, the weeds are firmly in control. <laughs> uh, despite the fact that, that it's mid-May, um, I do feel like the weeds are firmly in parts of my garden. Parts of it are fine, you know, where it's mulched thick, but like uh, we have a sedum garden with a, a collection of a whole bunch of different sedums. It's beautiful, but little things like chickweed, yeah. Um, dandelions, you know, they get in there. I have a huge, uh, beautiful patch of our native Apuntia cactus. And where do you think the dandelions love to come up? Oh. Right smack in the middle of that patch. I have the same problem and grasses growing oh, through. Yep. Yeah. They so. know. They they somehow manage to, to live where it's harder. But, you know, the weeds, it is important to manage them. But I also think that... Um, you know, weeding can be such a, a discouragement to people when they go outside and they look at their garden, they think, oh, geez, I'm just going to give up. I can never manage all of these weeds. And I think that's where a little bit of knowledge can potentially come in handy. Um, you know, like chickweed, for example, if, if you only have limited time or energy to devote to weeding, I'd actually leave the chickweed alone. It's a spring annual you know, it's going to go away. Yeah, sure. You don't ideally want those seeds to right. come and can perpetuate your chickweed issue. Um, but, you know, that's not where I would put my energies. I would instead put it into uh, pulling out grass weeds because that is a total nightmare. You know, if I was the garden queen of the universe, I would make it so that grass could never be a weed because... Oh. What a nightmare that thing is. Grass grows best where you wish it wouldn't. That exactly. <laughs> and you nailed it, Stacy. My point was going to be uh, familiarize yourself with the difference between annual weeds mm -hmm. or winter annual weeds and perennial weeds, and it will help with your control. 
Yeah, I have the same problem out in the garden. You know, we talk, I, I mentioned Europe in Germany. They have this phrase when you say goodbye to someone, you know, until we meet again, it's Auf Wiedersehen. Mm. I always look at the weeds and say Auf Wiedersehen because <laughs> they're coming back. Now, of course, on the internet, you're going to see a lot of gardening hacks, too. We've talked about that before. We're going to post a couple pictures for you at our website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. Uh, one of the pictures, folks uh, hammer out spoons out of the kitchen, flatten them, paint them, and paint them, and use them as uh, markers, row markers. That's clever. It's kind of clever. And then uh, pots, filling pots with uh, debris, trash. So you don't have Brick to spend so much money <laughs> <laughs> on potting soil. And this picture, of course, has uh, pop cans. Pop cans uh, in the. I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily do that. I'd I'd recycle the uh, the pop cans. Well, you know, here in Michigan, we do often forget that that uh, cans are not worth ten cents a piece elsewhere, so that's less of a, an investment. You know, I um, have been an on an ongoing battle about filling your container with uh, dunnage. You know, that's like what they call if you have yeah, a truck or something just to take up well take up space. Um, and you know, I totally get people wanting to use less potting soil. And a few weeks ago, we were talking about how potting soil is a resource. It is expensive. It should be conserved. It should be stretched. So I'm totally on board with that. But what I'm not on board with um, is is just trying to get out of it just for the sake of it. Because, you know, a plant's roots, depending on the depth of your container, it might actually need that entire right. container's worth of soil right. to really grow well and thrive. And Again, I get the temptation to save money, but unless your container is probably, I would say, over like 16 or 18 inches deep, I would go ahead and fill it all the way with soil and and just reuse it. And that makes, obviously, that financial expenditure of investing in all that soil a little less painful. I'm always trying to push it. I think uh, we should consult with our show attorneys. It's the firm Trillium Sage Gall and Fungus, and we'll find (laughs) out what appropriate protocol is. Hey, a wire frame for your cucumbers instead of having them sprawl all over the ground. I see a lot of that on Pinterest and on websites also using chicken wire, creating a frame at a 45 degree angle at the base of the cucumbers, allow them to grow up and it allows some air movement for those cucurbits also. And it's so much easier to harvest. Yeah. Particularly if you're trying to grow like smaller cucumbers for uh, pickles. Uh, it's a lot easier to harvest when everything is in that vertical plane than when you're scrambling on the ground and getting poked and pricked. And Yeah, exactly. So, there, you know, there's all kinds of things we can do here at the start. My advice today is to invest in fertilizer prills, P-R-I-L-L-S. It's essentially slow release, two to four month Uh, fertilizers, and it's a process of osmosis with nutrients releasing through this semi-permeable membrane. And you'll see these at the garden center, Stacey, and I love to pitch them in my containers uh, with plants that I'm establishing or my hanging baskets. But essentially, those prills release uh, fertilizers slowly but surely over a few months. Yeah, they have a pretty fascinating mechanism that I would encourage anybody who is interested, particularly if you are an engineering type. Um, their dispersal meth- method is, is really interesting, and it's based on temperature. Yes. So, you know, when you buy those kinds of products and it says, oh, feeds for whatever number of months, Um, that's depending on the temperature. So it usually is releasing at some sort of combination of 60 degree days and there's different size holes that the stuff comes out of. It's, it's really quite a fascinating engineering feat, but you know, you take those little prills, sprinkle them around and you don't even think about everything that went into them. Yeah. They're coated with, uh, in some cases, linseed oil, and then they slowly, but surely, uh, release that fertilizer. I love Uh, using them and they make a big difference and in your containers you could always supplement with some water soluble uh, fertilizer also Uh, I remember working in the garden center Stacy and and you see uh, a number of these prills in containers when people are out purchasing their plants and I had a lady return one saying I'm returning this plant because it has all kinds of insect eggs in it (laughs) Have you ever heard that? Oh, one? yes, many times. And they do, if you, you know, if you look up slug eggs, they do look like that, but the slug eggs aren't crunchy. They, exactly. <laughs> the prills, if you can crush them in between your fingers and they make a very satisfying little crunch. So there's my well-rooted advice for you. Coming up in our branching news segment, that's the fourth segment today, plant today, 
eat tomato. I'm going to talk about the $50 tomato that you can plant this spring and we'll celebrate with a limb a rick. But first, plants on trial. I'm looking forward to this one. Stacy's going to introduce a plant that gets a lot of conversation among people. They love it, but struggle with it. Yes. A lot of myths surrounding this plant that we are about to dispel. Myths surrounding it. You're tuned into the Gardening Simplified show. Plants on Trial is next. Stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show with Rick Weiss and me, Stacey Hervella. And this is the time of the show where we put a plant on trial, and that means we're going to tell you all about one of the 320 plus proven winners color choice shrubs. And you get to decide for yourself if it is going to get a spot in your garden. Now, when I pick plants on trial, I mean, I have 320 some choices. And if you just, if you take away the couple that we've already covered, that's still a lot of choices. So uh, it's always a little bit hard to pick one. So I use whatever you have decided to talk about in the first segment. Thank you very much. And um, because we had a big focus on soil, I wanted to talk to you today about a plant that does have specific soil needs. And that is dandy man purple rhododendron. And could it be said, Stacy, that dandy man or all rhododendrons have specific soil needs? Yes, all rhododendrons do require acidic soil. And not just rhododendrons, but pretty much every member of their scientific family, the Ericaceae. Uh, so that includes azaleas, blueberries, pyuris, which is sometimes known as Andromeda, mountain laurel, another popular landscaping plant, cranberry wintergreen, I could go on and on, heathers and heaths, and all of these plants. It's, it's not all that common necessarily for a, gene, uh, a family of plants to share cultural needs like this. You know, typically it's kind of dispersed. It's all over the place. It's very hard to generalize mm -hmm. from a scientific perspective on what the plants need from a horticultural perspective. But Ericaceae, the rhododendron or heath family, is that rare exception. And so I thought this was a really good opportunity to talk about why exactly rhododendrons need acidic soil. This is great stuff, folks. It really is. And Stacy, let me ask you, on top of that, with this family or with rhododendrons, uh, drainage or the soil type on top of pH is probably important. Uh, extremely important. If you would like to kill a rhododendron, the fastest way to do that is to make sure it's in very wet soil. Uh, they succumb to so many root diseases in wet soil, poorly drained soil. So if you've got a rhododendron, uh, well, Actually, I wouldn't recommend that you flood the soil because they're very shallow rooted and should be quite easy to remove by and large. But I do want to go back to this concept of acidity because I think a lot of people do know, oh, rhododendrons, those need acidic soil. Uh, but, you know, it's a misunderstanding or a misconception rather that rhododendrons need acidic soil out of a preference or an environment that their roots just like to grow in. Okay. It's not like, oh, this is a cozy acidic environment or this is what it's zesty and I really like it. <laughs> uh, zesty. <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it's acidic, it's zesty. Um, it's because nutrients, the, the major plant nutrients that plants require to survive um, are available at different proportions depending on the pH level of the soil. And there's all sorts of really neat, easy to understand diagrams. We will certainly put those in the show notes at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And what you'll see is that there are these kind of uh, different wedge shapes across this grid of each of the different nutrients. And it shows how they narrow or widen at various pHs. Okay. Now, the nutrients that are most available at a lower pH or a more acidic pH level are iron and nitrogen. And rhododendrons are notorious for being iron hogs. And that is why they really need that acidic soil. It's not so much the environment around their roots. It's that the nutrients that they need based on their, you know, physiological metabolism, that kind of thing. Their broadleaf nature. Are, their broadleaf nature are most available at those lower pH mm. levels. Okay. And so that's also why, you know, a lot of people probably you've seen in your time in the garden centers, someone will come in, oh, my rhododendron, it's all yellow, I need some iron. Well, yes, iron will temporarily do the trick, but if your rhododendron is deficient in something and you're seeing that yellowing foliage, 
it's almost certainly due to a problem in the pH level. And you're better off probably, if you can, fixing the pH level instead of trying to, you know, apply iron and fertilizer to remedy the situation. It's the classic example of the right plant in the right place. Huh, makes sense. Makes and, perfect sense. And, and, you know, I can't blame people for wanting rhododendrons because they are beautiful and they are shade tolerant. And, uh, you know, the neighborhood I grew up in over on the east side of the state, it was like rhododendrons were the choice for front yard landscaping. I don't think there was hardly any houses on our block that didn't have a rhododendron. Why? Because we had these kind of recessed porches. So it created these shady environments. And rhododendron was just like the go to thing. And they're very memorable. You know, they have those that big, bold oh, foliage, unreal. huge uh, flower buds that you really can't miss. And Dandy Man Purple has giant uh, snowball-like clusters of purple flowers. So purple snowball, this is not making any sense, flowers in the snowball shape, about the size of a snowball. They look fabulous. Use your imagination or look it up, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. We'll get sense. it there. It makes you. perfect sense. Don't, they, don't they remind you of snowballs? Makes me think of Sammy Davis Jr., you know, the dandy man makes everything he makes. <laughs> Satisfying and delicious musical interlude. Yes, that, that's always good. You can even eat the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan <laughs> Dandy Man is indeed quite dandy. It was uh, selected for its hardiness. Now, rhododendrons, oh. particularly for people in colder climates, not always known to be something that is very tolerant of cold temperatures. And not just, you know, oh, the temperature's cold, but they get a lot of damage. They're broadleaf evergreens, as Rick uh, so eloquently said a moment ago. And so that, you have those broad leaves. They're losing a lot of water over winter. The sun, the wind, all of that is contributing yep. to water loss. The rhododendrons, they curl their leaves to reduce the surface area that's losing water. And if that happens over a long time, we've all seen it, you know, you get those random branches that are completely dead. Um, so having a rhododendron like Dandy Man Purple that's better able to withstand cold temperatures, particularly for gardeners in zones for USDA 4 and 5, is wow. a really, really important factor. You know, that's interesting, Stacy, because uh, for me here in Michigan, I find the rhododendrons get big and beautiful the closer you are to the Lake Michigan shoreline. As you move inland, things like winter sun and wind can certainly create problems. Absolutely. And so they are kind of a great example of that classic coastal plant that really thrives with the more mild conditions yeah. closer. And you do see some absolutely beautiful rhododendrons around here. They're very long lived. Now I used to live on the East coast and you would see, you know, just massive, massive rhododendrons, 50 or, or so years old. We tend not to see them get quite that old. I don't know. Maybe we just get tired of things and, and rotate <laughs> through. Um, but we would definitely recommend taking a look at dandy man at purple. It comes to us from Maine. So okay. very appropriate there that it was being developed um, for hardiness. And we've talked a lot about, I think, some of the key factors for success with rhododendron. You're going to want an acidic soil. And if you don't know what your soil pH is, you can certainly get that tested. Um, you know, the standard pH test at your garden center will work just fine for giving you a rough idea of pH, or you can send away for a soil test. Um, but you definitely want to make sure that you're not creating a maintenance nightmare for yourself or an expense where you have to keep going back and fertilizing. Right. Right. Good drainage. Not really a huge issue for us out here on the lakeshore, but um, if you do live inland or you live in a place with clay soil or underlying bedrock, then you're definitely not going to want to plant it anywhere that drains slowly because, again, it goes back to those those roots. Avoid pruning a rhododendron. This is not one of those plants that you should be meatballing or cutting into a rectangular hedge. Rhododendrons are really, truly, I don't, I don't think this is just my opinion, at their no, best when they're allowed to just sort of attain their own beautiful shape and structure and this is not one if, if you favor trimming your hedges well my top three on my list you nailed it stacy are drainage uh soil ph and then for me again in northern states uh, you mentioned the porches on the east side of the state some kind of structural shade in winter really is helpful. It really is because then you're going to reduce all of that winter sun yeah. that's causing that water loss and can lead to premature or sectional death um, on the rhododendrons. Um, but, you know, I, they do take shade in deep, deep shade for most of us, especially in the north. You're, you're not going to see as many flowers. 
if they get too, too much shade. So you kind of want like that filtered light would be an ideal situation or morning sun is also a really good idea. But if you have the right conditions for a rhododendron, honestly, I think there are few specimen shrubs um, that you could do better than, than a rhododendron. Even though their bloom is relatively short, it is magnificent. That's the first time I ever heard that phrase. You're a wizard with words, uh, Stacy. You said sectional death. I had <laughs> never heard that about a plant before. I'm adding that but one. But you right did up see up that, right? On yeah, rhododendron, it. it's just yes. like one branch. No, just it's kinda, brilliant. Kinda sectional dies. death. Yes. Yeah, frustrating. Not good, but <laughs> at least we have a name for it now. Yes. So uh, listen, dand- <laughs> dandelion, dandy man purple rhododendron is available at your local garden center in the distinctive white proven winners container. Ask for it by name or take a look at gardening simplified on air.com to find out all the details. We've got to take a little bit of a break, but when we come back, we're answering your gardening questions. So don't <laughs> so just don't <laughs> don't do it <laughs> so please stay tuned <laughs> Greetings, gardeners, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. One of the ways that we try to simplify gardening for you out there is by answering your gardening questions. And, uh, you know, it's good to have a resource of people who have strong opinions about horticulture and a lot of experience. And we will give you both if you if you write in with questions. So to do that, you can visit uh, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. And that is the website. The- the website for the show, uh, or you can just uh, email us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. So what do we got in the mailbag today? Well, well put, Stacy. I have strong opinions on all of these questions, so let's get to them. Susan writes to us, we started three apple trees from seed. They're about 12 inches tall under grow lights. When should we plant them? Should they be hardened off first. Boy, she's going down the right road, Susan. Good job. Should they be hardened off first? A hundred percent. Yes, they should be. Yes, yes, yes. And a lot of people, I think they hear this hardening off term and they think, oh, that sounds hard or that sounds weird. I'm not sure. Do I need to do that? How do I do that? And hardening off really just kind of refers to the transition between the very um, safe and controlled environment of your dining room or kitchen or wherever you're growing those seedlings, uh, even under light, to the outdoors where the light is going to be way brighter. You're going to have harsh winds. You know, you've got all this air circulation. It's, it's really, from a plant's perspective, like a night and day kind of difference. So to just take something from this very, you know, sheltered environment and just shove it outside and say, okay, deal with it. Many plants will survive, but they will be set back because it's yeah. very stressful for them. Yeah, my, my best analogy living here on the lakeshore of Lake Michigan is what I see in June. People have been in that comfy indoor environment all year. And then all of a sudden they say, we're going to the beach and we're going to spend the whole day on the beach. And at the end of the day, whew, yeah. Not pretty. Even June in Michigan. <laughs> oh. It is very similar. There is there is definitely kind of want to, you, you know. Kind of work your way up to it. Some sunscreen, some visits yeah. to the tanning bed, whatever it means <laughs> to you, you are going to want to work your way up to it. So, yes, Susan, you should definitely harden them off. And now is really a perfect time to start hardening things off. You know, we might still have some dips into cooler temperatures, but you can easily take them inside if, if you think it's going to get too cold. But they should be outside in a shaded location. So you start with quite a lot of shade and then gradually move them to more and more sun and you know it only takes I usually do like a week to two weeks depending on you know the crop and how long it's been inside and what's what it's looking like what's your uh, usual time frame yeah same thing and I think that not only sun but you've got to get them used to the wind yep the wind can create real problems so a little bit at a time don't put them outside all day long on a windy day you're gonna have trouble Right. And then as soon as they're hardened off, you can go ahead and get them in the ground. But do be careful. This goes for anyone, any who's growing any kind of seedling. Uh, those tender seedlings that have just come out of your house are like a delight to rabbits and mice and deer and whoever else you might have visiting your yard. So if you can harden things off above mouth level um, or protect them in some way so that, you know, 
they're just going to be super, super appealing to rabbits, especially. So you want to make yeah. sure you don't lose all your hard work right there at the finish line. <laughs> a salad buffet. Hey, Craig has a question. I have mature red and white oak trees in my yard with the recent warm weather this week. Can I still prune them this weekend without fear of getting oak wilt? I'm glad that oak wilt is on uh, Craig's radar. I'm extremely glad to hear that, yes. And uh, we'll put a link on the website, but I want to mention uh, again here in Michigan, uh, there's a website, michiganoakwilt.org. And Stacy, what they have on that website is an oak wilt risk meter. Ooh, interesting. And you can follow that risk meter, the times when we're at greatest risk, lower risk, and no risk. Okay, that's good to know. But in a nutshell, if you don't have time to go to the uh, risk assessment tool there, uh, you should not prune oaks at all between April and July, and some people even say into August. Agreed. And uh, that's a really good practice. And this doesn't just mean heavy-duty pruning where you're taking out limbs or trimming. It means even small wounding of the plant, like little twigs, all of that. Because the way that oak wilt works is it's a fungal disease. And if you open up a wound in an oak tree and those fungal spores are floating up in the air, it can take it in and it will kill the tree. They, some, some people call it sudden oak death because it's it, it can happen so, so very quickly. So you really want to make sure that you're not creating any conditions for oak wilt to enter your oaks that you actually have in your yard. And that means avoiding any kind of pruning during that window. And I think, you know, one really important thing uh, that people should consider, any good arborist, if you call them to prune your oaks, is going to say, no, I'm not going to prune these oaks right now. And if an arborist is doing it anyway, or says they'll do it anyway, Run. call a different arborist, Run. please, because ah. <laughs> it's not just the risk to your oaks, but it, it kind of just shows that they don't have a good handle on any other potential risks or problems that yeah, could agreed. occur. And so um, it's good that people know this, you know, it kind of is like a double-edged, uh, a, you know, outreach approach where, you know, we need to reach the trade and say, hey, definitely be very careful around your oaks, but homeowners as well, because some people maybe have a smaller one that they can, you know, prune themselves. But this is a very, very serious disease. It's not a native disease. And if we were to lose oaks uh, at scale in Michigan, it would be really, truly nothing short of an ecological disaster. No other tree hosts as many different species of caterpillars. So butterflies, moss, and thereby birds. I mean, it's just, I, I don't even want to think about it. I'm no, getting I upset. Agree. So. <laughs> it's a serious issue, and that's why there are websites devoted to it. You know, with that risk meter, you're right. Uh, it says the greatest risk is April 15 to July 15. Lower risk, March 15 to April 14. But the recommended time for pruning is November to February. When they're completely dormant. Just to be safe. When yep. they're completely uh, dormant. By the way, May is Oak Wilt Awareness Month. Oh, I think we've done our part. I hope. Yeah, I hope so. And we will, of course, put some links for you at the website, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, so you can do your own research. And if you live in a different state, Oak a Wilt is an issue in many, many states, uh, you might want to look at your state's specific resources on Oak Wilt because that time frame will change a bit based on your climate. Meredith writes us a question. I have a tiny wine nine bark. Oh boy, I planted last fall, it's in Zone 5, Ontario, Canada. I was told when I bought it, I should be chopping it back annually, in parentheses, a lot. Hmm. I've seen that coppicing or coppicing, I'm calling it coppicing or coppicing? I say coppicing. But... Coppicing. Coppicing nine barks prevents you from seeing blooms in the current year and can ruin its appearance. I've also read that older branches won't be as durable and need to be chopped. So what's the best approach for pruning nine barks? Uh, so my approach to pruning nine barks is to do nothing. <laughs> I am I agree. I am opposed to regular pruning or trimming of nine barks. I have several nine barks in my yard. The ginger wine is my absolute favorite. And I have always found that uh, pruning any kind of like trimming into the plant really destroys uh, the beautiful, elegant, natural habit 
of a nine bark, a little bit like we were talking about with the rhododendrons. They do have a very natural sort of a graceful arching habit. And if you're trimming them back, meatballing them, anything along those lines, you're going to get witches brooming and you're going to mm-hmm. get these funny little growths sticking out all over. It'll be like, I don't know, a squadron of cheerleaders or something with just, pom-poms. Yeah, it just doesn't look natural. It's kind of like I think back to the 60s when my mom would put a pot on my head and cut my hair that way, you know, go around the print. It just doesn't look good. It's not natural. It might be easy, but it's not good. And, you know, that also is no doubt uh, leading to some of the issues you might be seeing with flowering because uh, yeah. nine bark is a shrub that blooms on old wood. So basically what that means is it has its flower buds for spring all through fall, the, pre- the preceding fall and winter. And so if you are cutting it any time from basically like August uh, through, you know, when it would normally bloom in June, you're removing the flower buds. Yeah. And I think it makes a good point, too, that with a variety of shrubs, even nine bark, uh, when we say prune, sometimes it means just pruning out some old wood or weak branches, pruning it out all together. But don't do that little off the top thing. Absolutely. You know, and that's a lot of people say, oh, what, I can't prune it. No, you can selectively prune out branches. Exactly. So you're, you're identifying some branches that maybe are going in a direction you don't want them to go or are just, you know, old and not as productive uh, with the nice, colorful new growth. You can take those out, but this is definitely not one where you're getting the hedge clippers out and and shaping it. Uh, If you want to do that, choose something else, not nine bark. So as for Meredith, I would say stop pruning your nine bark. Let it its haircut grow out. Um, Hopefully it's still young enough that it will be able to acquire that, you know, graceful natural habit on its own. And if it's too late for this year, don't worry. There's always next year. So just avoid pruning it and you can look forward to nine bark flowers in 2024. You know, Stacy, with all three of these questions, we were both strongly opinionated. Not the first time. That's a good thing. it won't be the last. That's why they pay (laughs) us the big bucks. (laughs) Well, we got to take a little bit of a break right now. But when we come back, Rick's got branching news and his weekly limerick. So please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news, not breaking news, but we don't make this stuff up. Stacy, plant today, eat tomato, a story from the Philadelphia Inquirer for all those foodies out there who are about to plant their vegetable plants. There are those who feel really nostalgic about gardening. Maybe they saw their dad or their grandpa do it, but they have no time. They have money, so they hire somebody to do it fascinated by it i mean i personally enjoy the process but i respect those who don't and uh that gives a lot of opportunity for people like you and me who actually like to do it well exactly it's big bucks though i tell you what for a couple of four by eight uh foot beds and then they maintain them during the gardening season so you don't have to water you don't have to weed you don't have to fertilize i don't know why this story just blew me away because i'm like you stacy i love doing it But I suppose if you don't have the time, you have the money. Great. There you go. So we're going to post the story uh, on the website. It did cause me, though, to think about the money you put into fertilizer and plants and soil and timbers or whatever else it may be. And we always joke about that $50 tomato at the end of the season. So I put together a limb, a rick. For you this week, my raised vegetable garden, I commence in its construction. I will spare no expense. The components cost me lots of dough. I calculated each backyard tomato cost me $52.39. So there you go. That's my limerick. (laughs) Well, you know, in addition to gardening, I also knit. And so if my husband ever says anything, he's like, oh, it's hobby time. So that's how I look at it too. <laughs> we time. spend money on our hobbies and gardening. If gardening is your hobby, then all of the money that you spend is going towards your own personal enrichment. And if gardening's not your hobby and you want to pay someone else to do it, well, I can tell you there are a whole bunch of horticulturists out there who will be at your service. Well said. Well said. Well, Stacy, uh, thousands and thousands of people uh, download the Gardening Simplified Show podcast. We thank you for that. Watching on YouTube, listening on radio, and in a recent study, tells us what people are doing while listening to a podcast. 30% of people are doing household chores while they listen, and 30% are driving around. Those are the main things. Other things were unwinding after a long day, taking a walk, working, eating a lunch, uh, eating a meal or a lunch break. 
et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't say anything about working in the garden unless that's lumped into household chores. Well, you know, when I'm gardening, uh, there's obviously a lot of good par- gardening podcasts and other podcasts, and I love to listen to music, but honestly, when I'm outside gardening, I want to hear the birds. Oh, yeah. That's what I really, so I'm not, maybe I'm not all that surprised uh, that it's not on there, but that's my own personal approach. And I love to talk to my plants while I'm out there. We carry on these uh, conversations, which is a very scary thing. But we're going to share with you on the website, again, gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. I thought this was cute from parade.com. Plant names for your precious, angelic little baby plants. And I went through the list, and it was pretty creative. Name your plants grove, or rainy, or bamboo, or pokey or Chugs, or Mrs. Potts. You can go through the list. All right. It's pretty interesting. I don't name uh, my plants, but I do name the animals that visit my yard every oh, year. Oh, <laughs> really? Can't. Yeah, I do. You have names for the chipmunks? Uh, no, I don't really get chipmunks, but the rabbits and the hummingbirds uh, will usually uh, get, get their own names. I like that. I like that a lot. This from the Akron Beacon Journal in 2002, residents led a public campaign to save a large white ash tree when the city announced plans to remove it for construction of a curb ramp, and the neighbors prevailed. Yay! But then what happened? Emerald ash. Oh, no. Took the tree out. Ah, Too bad, in 2015. So they cut the tree down there in Akron, and then an artist, uh, the name is Michael Morris. I hope I got that name right. He long had admired that tree, so he turned the stump into artwork in September of 2016 when he secretly installed a sword. Neighbors were mystified one day to wake up and see Excalibur. Oh, that's great. Boy, oh boy, King Arthur would be uh, would be proud. The Excalibur sword, and people uh, people loved that. They uh, the, the point here in the story is they the stump had rotted and they had to grind it out. So oh. the sword is gone. Well, you know, they don't last forever, but you can enjoy them while they do. Yeah. Speaking of uh, King Arthur, do you know that I'm a knight? Uh, I do did not. Did this just happen on your trip to Europe? They call me Sir Plants a lot. <laughs> I don't have authorization to tell you that joke, but I did anyhow. Okay, sorry. Way to go, This is Akron. a rectangular table, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no round table here. Uh, you remember the story we did on neighborhoods complaining about the noise of pickleball courts popping up all over the place? Well, here's your answer. Pickleball's rapid spread has created dilemmas for public parks, recreation departments. Uh, You know, they got to have the space. They have to have the funds. Retirement communities or neighborhoods face challenges. You know, that constant pop, pop, pop. Oh, I know it well. Right? But I love pickleball and I like to play uh, pickleball. So pickleball is heading to the malls where players can play and then grab a bite to eat or do some shopping. At least that's what landlords hope. So with many of these malls, they're losing their big anchor stores and they're converting them into pickleball arenas or areas where you can play pickleball year round and the neighbors don't have to deal with the noise. And that's great because I think even if if it didn't make that noise, uh, it's becoming so popular that you can barely get on a court around here anymore. So uh, more is better. You know, uh, over in the Detroit area, they've turned a lot of those abandoned stores into swimming schools for kids. Have they really? Yes. So they put in a big pool and then they have like kids parties and swimming lessons and, you know, I think it's really great that they found ways to, uh, to use all Absolutely. those old buildings. Absolutely. And pickleball, well, we just deal with it. It's kind of a big deal. Okay. An extended gardening season here in the north. I want to talk to you about this, Stacy, because I'm a big fan of El Nino. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Our, our new uh, My Chitelpa? good buddy. My oh. good buddy, El Nino. <laughs> We have a new plant called El Nino, so that's why I was thinking. Tell me about the plant. Oh, it's fabulous. It's one of my absolute favorite that we offer in the entire line. It's a hybrid between Chilopsis, which is known as Desert Willow, and Catalpa, uh, which is uh, the bean tree that you know we grew, mm-hmm. that's native here. Right. Both native shrubs. They are hybridized. It's uh, only hardy to USDA Zone 6, but the flowers, I can't even describe the smell. Um, it's kind of like a ripe 
cantaloupe with vanilla. It's just the most beautiful smell. You're the flowers me. look like orchids. It's a fabulous plant. Okay, this is breaking news. <laughs> So for our listeners who are driving along in the car, doing household chores or whatever it may be, uh, tell us again what the plant is. What is the name of the plant? It's El Nino Chitulpa. So it's a hybrid, interspecific hybrid, or intergeneric hybrid, which means it's a hybrid between two genera, Chilopsis and Catelpa. So the name is Chitulpa. And we don't really have a good common name for it, so we're calling it Desert Orchid. But like I said, it's hardy to USDA Zone 6, heat tolerant through at least Zone 9, and it's one of those plants that you really have to see and smell to believe. Desert Orchid will be much easier for me, <laughs> and I think for many of our listeners. I think it's a plant you'd like too. So. Oh, yes, this is fantastic. Well, you know, the reason I like El Nino so much is uh, here, at least in the north and in Michigan, uh, we uh, we generally get a warmer, drier winter, so I don't mm. have to pack the shorts away. Maybe uh, work out in the yard a little bit. I know on the West Coast it causes a lot of rain, but of course they could use that rain. Sure. So in the Ohio Valley, uh, uh, warmer, so don't pack away those shorts. We'll be playing pickleball in winter here in the north, and I'm looking forward to it. So thank you, El Nino. Not quite gardening season, but if it's less snow shoveling, I'm all for it. It's a stretch, but I'm all for <laughs> it too. Hey, happy trellis to you until we weed again. Thank you, Stacy. Always fun to do this show with you. And a big thank you very much to Adriana Robinson. For folks who watch on YouTube, listen on the radio or listen to our podcast. She does such an incredible job with this show, and we thank Adriana. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Adriana. And thanks to all of you for listening. It means so much to us. 